So thank you very much. It's a very great pleasure for me to be here today. So let's talk about uh, medical simulators, especially a type of medical simulators, which are the so-called hybrid simulators. So before I give you some more details, and these details, of course, are a little bit technical, so I hope you're prepared for that. So let me give me, give me a short history for a medical simulation, what you can see here. So everything starts at 1960, where uh, Lerl uh, developed the mannequin, which is basically designed for uh, ventilation. And starting from that time, two basic full mannequin simulators were developed. The one by Danson and Abrahamson, which is called Sim 1 at 1966 and by Gordon and Fellner Harvey, which is uh, developed in 1970. These were full-scale mannequins where basically you were able to measure uh, ECG, for instance, where you were able to uh, look whether the person or the mannequin is breathing and so on, and they were controlled mainly electronically. They were very far beyond their time, so basically after this time, these uh, innovations were not used anymore. So, in between 1975 and 1980, they used more or less uh, actors where students were going to be trained, and these actors play a patient with uh, some symptoms, and uh, the students have to learn by that and have to train by that. But after, it's about 1986, uh, they restarted the development of such simulators, which was the case simulators developed in Stanford, and from that time on, a lot of these uh, medical simulators based on technological innovations were available for the development and also for the education in medical. So what were the innovation triggers basically which allowed to develop such simulators? So the starting basically for using simulators in education was already uh, at the 1930s where the flight simulator was developed by the Link. So the Link simulator was used to train pilots in order to be safe, to drive safe or to operate safe an airplane. And uh, especially during World War II, about 500,000 pilots were trained by these simulators. So based on that innovations, uh, there were some critical things which were necessary to develop these medical simulators. So some years after, if you remember, at 1960 developed these first medical simulators, of course, a little bit stimulated by these flight simulators. So the same idea was uh, captured by medicals in order to train their students. But however, in between, there was some, some gap, mainly according to the available technology. So if you remember, in between 75 and 80, they were going down with the simulators and used actors for the training. But if you see it somewhere around, around uh, 1980, there were some innovations, basically, which were very important. Before they were able to use the first video laparoscopy, of course, the digital camera was developed already in 1972. And if you look at the top picture here, so just here, you can see the publications per year taken from Scopus, where you can see that we have different keywords. So medical simulation, simulator-based based learning. And you can see everything starts somewhere around the 1990s. And what you can see on the bottom here are the prices for technology where you can see this is the price for uh, storage. So how many dollars per megabyte? This is the price for computational power. And this is the price for megapixel, that meaning digital cameras. And you can see that around 1990, all these prices were going down because the technology was developing that high. And at the same time, you can see that all these publications go to a reasonable number. So a lot of publications in medical simulation, in simulation-based learning, 
just before a little bit in virtual reality and a little bit later on in augmented reality. So we have a lot of good ideas even going back to the 1960s, but it took some time that we have also the technology available to develop these ideas, to develop these simulators and to bring these simulators to the education. So actually, it's about, I think, uh, around the 1975 where pilots have to make their simulation hours on a simulator. So if we project this to the medical engineers, of course it takes, or the medical uh, experts to the medical doctors, then of course it takes some time, but I believe in the future also a medical doctor has to do the hours on the simulator in order to prove that he is able to uh, do the skills which are required. So which kind of simulators do we have? We can say we have different modalities of simulators. The first uh, simulator was already mentioned. This is not a technologi technological solution. It's the standardized patient, which are actors trained to behave like a patient. Typically, of course, they are required, especially in that field where you have to interact with persons and where you have to get the information from the person. So technology cannot put everything uh, in uh, this account. Then we have model-based simulators. What you can see here is a mannequin. <laughs> so fly, likes me. This is a mannequin uh, in the form of a baby. So this is a high technological simulation that baby can breathe, that can open and close the eyes, can change the color of the skin and so on. And medical doctors can train different aspects on that simulator. So these are model-based or mannequin-based simulators. We call these simulators also simulators which belong to the physical reality. So they are real physical. You can touch these simulators. Then we have the other reality, which is called the virtual reality, where the entire simulator is just inside a computer program. So you have a 3D scene where you can have, for instance, the interior of your body, where you can see the heart, where you can see uh, different parts of the anatomy, and you can train there uh, doing some surgical skills, for instance. Uh, these are completely computer-based systems where we can generate some force feedback of specialized devices. Of course, there are also pure computer simulation programs where you can uh, train typical interventions and interactions with uh, uh, patients where you can uh, try to find out where you behave right or wrong. So these are the different modalities of simulators and let me give you some more detailed examples about these different types of simulators. So what you can see here is an actual state-of-the-art mannequin which is used in uh, emergency simulations. So you can see this mannequin has a lot of different parts. So for instance, if you look at the top here, you can see breathing is possible spontaneous. We have, or you can see uh, chest movements. You can see, or you can measure the flow resistance by specialized devices. You can measure uh, different parts of the breathing which is important for the medical doctor in order to find a decision. And you can reuse the real instruments and the real devices you are used to use in your clinic. So you can measure some critical uh, parameters. Uh, the eyes are able to move, the lids are able to open or close. You have a pupil reflex and especially you also have tear flute. So these are high specialized devices you can think of and in the interior of that simulator you have to have a lot of technology, you have to have a lot of sensors and actuators which are able to use here. Uh, for instance, if you look at this here, it's also possible to have realistic bleeding, so there are specialized modules, uh, especially also simulating an amputee, where you really have this bleeding and the intervention would be to stop that bleeding. So all these things can be trained by these uh, full-size mannequins. Controlled, 
are these mannequins by a monitor, which is typically actually over VLAN, over wireless LAN, where you can just adjust different types and the behavior of that simulator. So you can also change spontaneously uh, the situation of the simulator and the group of medical doctors has to react correctly. The second type of simulators I've mentioned are the so-called virtual reality simulators. Uh, most of these simulators are used uh, when you talk about surgical skills, so where you have to cut, where you have to do different operations inside basically the body. So you have a 3D scene of that what basically belongs to, so you can see vessels, you can see muscles, you can see connective tissue, you can see also fluids, you can see blood there, but basically the entire operation scene is inside a 3D computer model. Of course, this is very demanding for the computer, but basically you cannot touch anything there. Of course, you can interact some with uh, the trainee by specialized devices. These are so-called haptic devices where you can operate it like a mouse you're used to with when, you, uh, to when you work with your uh, laptop, but basically you get a little bit of force feedback. So you can feel how big and how large the resistance is in that simulation. But this is limited, of course, to a certain amount. Uh, a newer type of simulators, and that's basically now the topic I'm going to talk then more in detail, are the so-called hybrid simulators. Hybrid simulators combine both. So just say we combine a mannequin with a computer program, a computer model, and put them together. So we can touch the mannequin, we have a physical reality, but we can extend that physical reality by a computer program, providing us with views which are not available in the physical reality. And these are the so-called hybrid simulators. So these hybrid simulators typically consists of a certain kind of mannequin. Of course, in that case, it's not the full-scale mannequin, it's only that region which is important. And you can use the real instrument with this simulator in order to do your training in order to do and to train the intervention. So before we start with the more details and giving you more information about that, just think about where are the application areas of such simulators. So there was a study in 2011 uh, by the American College of Me American Association of Medical Colleges and they were asking where simulators were used and you can see the different dimensions starting by medical knowledge, patient care, team training, leadership and going down to psychomotor tasks, that means skills training. You have three, dim three different areas here. You have the education, of course, which is the blue line. So most of the simulation is used in education, but you can see also for the assessment. It's important, that's the red line, that also for the assessment of already working surgeons, already working medical doctors, it's a very important thing that we have simulators. And actually, if you think back to the example of the pilot, pilot assessment is done basically also on a simulator. So maybe thinking of that, that this would be also a very important thing. And the green line would be the research where also research is done by means of simulators. So the second thing is, okay, we know there are simulators and we have good examples from the aviation area from the pilot training on a simulator. So why should we use the simulator in medical education? And once again, let me show you an example. This exa sorry for that. So this example basically shows for a special intervention in anesthesi anesthesiology, which is the epidural anesthesia. That means uh, the medical doctor brings a very small needle just between uh, the vertebra into a special small area which is the, called the epidural space. The epidural space is just before the spinal cord. cord. And there some uh, drug is applied in order to get the thing working, of course. And this is a blind process. So 
the, 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 the medical doctor does not have any um, information about its position, so there is no imaging device, there is no ultrasound typically, there is no fluoroscopy typically, so the only information he has is the information about anatomy and the haptic feedback. So he can feel about the resistance when he progresses the needle. And what you can see here is the learning curve. The learning curve over about 90 trials, so 90 performed procedures. And this was done by the investigation. You can see the source there. And you can see that, of course, the first 30 trials are not very satisfying because we are around uh, with success rate, which is on the y-axis, which is somewhere around 50, 60 percent. You can imagine what is a success rate of 50 to 60 percent. So every second trial is not really working, okay? So when we look at this learning curve, we can see different stages. This is the three-stage uh, model of the motor skill acquisition by uh, Pete Posner. You can see the first stage is the cognition state where we have to understand first the task. So the first thing is we really have to think step by step what to do. Then we have the integration, which is more comprehend and performing mechanics. So once again, we can use our knowledge and try to reproduce a good movement. But this movement is not as fluid as it should be. And in the automated, automated, automation phase, we can perform the task with speed, efficiency, and precision. So this stage model, of course, uh, is true for different aspects, not, for not only for medical education. So if you imagine that a student is in the cognition or the integration phase, do you want to be the patient there where the person is trying to do that? Of course not. So basically, the goal of such simulators is to bring this first phase of the learning curve away from the operating room, away from the patient, and to allow this uh, training on a simulator where it can be in a safe environment for the medical doctor as well as for the patient. So that's the basic idea in behind. So now we talk about hybrid surgical simulators. I have talked before, a hybrid surgical simulator consists of a patient phantom that means physical reality. We have a real phantom, we can touch it on, we can use the real instruments, and then we have the interaction to the surgeon. We can have a simulated imaging where we can make simulated images of the real instruments there, of the uh, phantom, and of course we can have a computer program which is basically uh, controlling all the progress and is also assessing uh, the student. So let me show you what are the main research fields which are important for such hybrid surgical simulators. Of course, everything starts with the, with the artificial anatomy, where you can get some examples later on. Then we need a 3D tracking device, where typically when we use the real instruments, we want to know where is the instrument relatively to our phantom. Then we talk about smart surgical instruments, that means we can extend our instruments with some measurements in order to measure force, temperature, and so on. Then we talk about augmented reality, where we can generate overlays to the physical reality. We talk about simulated imaging, where we want to simulate fluoroscopy, CT, MRI, and ultrasound images. Of course, assessment is very important, that we have a good and an objective assessment of the procedure we are talking about. And finally, this is also very important, is the validation of such a simulator. That means, finally, when a simulator is developed, we have to be sure that this is a valid simulator and can be really used in reality and is a good representation of the reality, the real situation. So give me, let give me you some examples uh, of this uh, uh, artificial anatomy. So what we are going to develop, for instance, are artificial bones. And what you can see here is an artificial vertebra. So you can see the vertebral body, which is looking like this. What you can see here also is also a particle screw inside. A particle screw is used to fixate 
uh, different segments of the spine in order to overcome a problem, for instance, with the intervertebral disc and so on. And what you can see here is that this artificial bone is intended to be as much as realistic as it is also in our human body. So you can see we have a cortical bone, which is the hard shell, and inside we have the cancellar bone, which behaves quite similar to, re to, uh, to the real bone. So what we want to train is that this artificial bone behaves very similar to the real bone, that we can insert instruments, that we can insert implants, and the surgeon can feel the realistic haptics. This is one very important thing, the artificial anatomy. Of course, we do not have only bones, we also have uh, soft tissue, muscles, connective tissue, so we have also to develop this uh, artificial soft tissue, and you can see one very impressive example of a company which is called Syndeva. They develop a whole, whole body anatomy by artificial uh, soft tissue and heart tissue. You can see that it's important to give a very realistic view of that situation, but on the second part it's very important that you also have a real haptics. So what's also important is that we uh, have to do the tracking of the real devices. So we use either uh, optical, mar optical markers, so you need a camera, and this camera is tracking the medical device by uh, a computation of the position of the markers. And we can use uh, magnetic markers, which are markers which are small coils, and you can measure according to a magnetic field the position of that marker in that magnetic field. So basically what are the advantages of the sensor coil is it's very small, so you can see it's about 10 millimeters long and one millimeter in diameter, but you need a cable, that is one big disadvantage of the magnetic thing. Uh, the optic thing has a, a very good advantage that you don't need a cable, but you have typically the problem if you just be in between the camera and the marker, then of course the camera cannot see the marker and you get uh, wrong position. The next very important uh, thing, I skipped one fall because, or one slide, because we are, have to have a short time. So in that case, it's very important, or you can see also a good example, and we'll show you a short video, that when you talk about uh, augmented reality, it's very important that you can have an interaction in between the physical world, the physical mannequin, and the computer model. And what you can see here is now an example where you can see a part of a knee, and you can see some markers. These markers are tracked by a camera system, and the person is wearing a hat display, a hat-worn display, and based on that information, the person or the medical expert, medical doctor, gets additional information on that. And you will see now that this soft part here is now replaced by a software, and you can see with the device and the haptical device and the instrument that then you can train and simulate the cutting of the soft tissue in that simulation. So you can see here the over overlay, and now you can see the real device with a haptical device and now he's going to cut the soft tissue. And you can see the deformation as well as the cutting. And with the haptical device, the trainee is feeling the resistance, of course. So what is the big advantage of that? Of course, if we are using a real soft tissue we are cutting, then once it is cut, we can throw it away. In that case, okay, we can play a little bit around with that, and we can also find different haptic sensations. We can define different things. The big disadvantage is in that case that you need once again such a haptical device in order to provide the, the force feedback. So I have talked just before about uh, medical or Im medical image simulation or image simulation or simulated imaging. Uh, the talk or the task here is to 
provide the trainee with a medical image he typically acquires during the intervention. So if we have a medical intervention, there are some interventions which are image-guided. So the medical expert is taking a picture by fluoroscopy, for instance, and then gets an information about the orientation and position of the, the instrument. In our case, we do not want to work with x-rays, so therefore we are going to simulate this. And once again, you can see a video where you can see this uh, simulated imaging. In that case, it's an intervention which is a, a so-called segment augmentation technique. Here it's the real situation. And now we have the simulator here, and you can see that it's possible to get the real-time information of the instrument as well as some projections of the situation we are going to use. So basically, we are taking the position of the instrument, we are taking the position of the phantom, and we can get a medical image which is used then in order to get the information of the position of the needle, as you can see here, for controlling that intervention. And this is also a very important thing what the surgeon, for instance, has to learn. Well, we have talked about validation, which is a very important aspect. We have two steps of validation in our case. So the first step is the biomechanical validation. That means we have this artificial anatomy and we want to know whether this haptic sensation of this anatomy is correct. So we are doing a lot of measurements with human specimen and check whether our artificial anatomy behaves identically or very realistic with respect to the human specimen. So for instance, what you can see here is a needle insertion into an artificial vertebrae and a needle insertion into a human vertebrae from a specimen. And then we compare our measurement on the specimen to the measurement uh, with the artificial bone, and we try to adjust the artificial bone such that there is a good agreement in between. What you also can see that we work on uh, different other aspects. What you can see here is the cement distribution. So if you take a cannula and if you uh, bring some cement inside the vertebral body, this cement distributes in between the uh, vertebral body. And the distribution, once again, of course, depends on the structure of the cortical, uh, of the cancellous bone. And in that case, you can see the cement distribution on a human vertebrae and once again the cement distribution on our artificial vertebrae during different steps of application of the cement. So this is the biomechanical validation of the, the mannequin side of the simulation. So finally, when the simulator is ready, of course, we have to do an entire simulator validation. This is typically done in that way that you take some medical experts, if you take some medical novices, and you let them train on the simulator and you assess this, this uh, quality of the training by these parameters you are going to develop, and then you try to find out whether this was good or wrong. And there are different aspects, for instance, where you can then find out whether there is a good quality of the assessment when you can distinguish in between experts and novices or as well as intermediates. So what you can see here on a short video once again is such a validation on a simulator where a person is uh, doing this uh, needle instruction or intrusion into the, into the vertebral body. You can see this in a little bit at uh, faster speed. And once again, you can see the projection the uh, trainee is using in order to get the orientation of position and orientation of the needle inside the vertebral body. Now you can see that this was successful. So the tip of the needle is inside the vertebral body in the correct position. And then finally, we can analyze what is the 3D trajectory. Was this really the right access pass? does not be there any, any uh, problem because you can also get the wrong pass and then you are inside the spinal cord and maybe you have uh, there a bigger problem. So basically, to sum it up, uh, simulators are well developed actually and of course there's a lot, to, a lot to do from the technological side. But actually we can say we are really so far that we can really take the first steps of such a learning curve back from the operating room, back from the patient, 
and we can, can try to train it on a simulator and to assure that this can be in a safe environment for both the patient as well as the medical expert. So thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And I can see the huge applications it has for uh, clinical teaching and learning. Um, the one question I have is how do you uh, get the anatomical variation that applies in human specimens as opposed to a mannequin where the variation may not be as great? Because if, if someone's practicing on 90 patients and 90 attempts on a mannequin, the, the type of learning curve would be quite different. And for me, you know, there's such great anatomical variation. How is this factored into the learning? So, of course, it's uh, possible to provide these variations, uh, of course, also to a mannequin. If you provide a mannequin with different aspects, you can provide a mannequin for uh, a person which is, uh, has not that much fat and you can really touch the processus spinosa of the spine. And then a second mannequin look, can look like this is a more obese person having a lot of fat and you cannot touch it really. So you can, of course, provide some variation of the mannequins. And it's not possible to provide every variation. But if you get to the edges of the possible variation, you will have a good job, of course. Yeah, uh, we have a medical school, and we just started a me medical simulation lab. And uh, you're right. Uh, you can simulate basically all the spectrum of the, of the types of uh, behaviors of an, uh, somebody that is, is in a critical condition or a regular condition. Uh, I mean, complementing that, because I've, I've seen it and I've used it. I'm not a medical doctor, but I've used it with our medical students and our residents. But my question is, uh, it's been very helpful at our university for our nursing school and for medical school and residents in specialties, but how do you know the size? I mean, I'm not a, an expert because we started in February or March, and it's already full, and they have a waiting line. Is there any uh, size of the, or any indicators of what type of, uh, what the numbers and all that, and depending on the, I know it has to depend on the number of students and all that, but can you tell me a little bit of what your experience is or what, of the of number of mannequins, the number of, uh, project or uh, equipment that you have in the simulator, or depending on the number of students, I assume. But So, uh, of course, it's a little bit uh, difficult to, to answer this question because I'm coming from the technology side, and, of course, we are developing these simulators, but uh, the application of the simulators are by the cooperation partners. So this strongly depends on the size of the school and what you really want to, to uh, educate in your curricula. But what you can say is that it's not always necessary to have a very complicated, high technological simulation. So you can start with uh, some basic skills, and basic skills can be trained on very simple simulators, and then you can increase the compet compet competency and, of course, of course, also the complexity of the simulator. So therefore, you have the whole range of simulators which are available but not always the, the most sophisticated technological solution is the problem solution for, for the education. That what can be also the thing is, you can see different type of simulators starting with a very simple simulator, which is a banana, okay? And you can try the needle insertion there and you have the first uh, basic sensations, of course. This is a very famous Greengrocer's model just developed in the uh, uh, 1990s, I think, yeah? And then you can see with progress of the complexity of the simulator, of course, the fidelity is also starting to increase, but you can see also in the fidelity a kind of saturation. And typically, if you reach this saturation, you have a little bit a higher increase in the costs of the simulator. So basically, the question is, what is the right combination of very simple simulators to high-fidelity simulators in order to build up a very good curricula for the medical students. Yeah, thank you very much for a very insightful presentation. Has there been much research 
undertaken as to the learning effects? I mean, it, it does appear quite self-evident, but sometimes the most self-evident things are not always correct. Um, and, and in particular, has there been any research undertaken as to the speed of learning? So uh, have, the, have the simulators been able to accelerate the, uh, the speed of learning? So, of course, this is the, the most difficult thing. When you are going to develop a simulator, first we, are, we have to tackle the technical problems. And then we start with the validation phase, where first we have to find out whether, whether the simulator is working right, whether the sim simulator is going to be realistic. And at a certain stage of the simulator, of course, you have to think about the predicted or predicted validity, which basically means you have two groups of uh, students which are training the one group on the simulator, the other group by the traditional training. And finally, you have to compare the, the outcome uh, of that training by means of the clinical outcome. But this is very time consuming and there are not that much results already in the literature according to this predictive validity. And that's basically that what concerns. So the question is, when you train on a simulator, is it more safe to the patient and to the student? And maybe you can acquire the skills more effective than you compared to the, the traditional path. But there are not that much results already. So it's the, the final hard work which takes a lot of time. Yeah, I, I very much appreciate that. I guess the question coming from the perspective of uh, we've just invested, I have a medical school, we've just invested quite heavily in a simulator um, and students love it, the dean of medicine loves it, but my CFO doesn't like it so much. <laughs> right, and, and we're going through the process as to how we can try and evaluate it to see whether or not we will scale it up further. And we have been looking for research and we've been talking to other institutions and it's very difficult to actually find, as you say, some research that validates you know, the direct impact on, on student learning. So this is of course also our interest, but uh, first you have to have a good simulator which is validated to the first levels. And once you have a validated simulator, then you can start to acquire this knowledge. So, this would be an interesting uh, topic, of course, but actually you will not find that much information in the, in the, in the research area.